I'm in the Northern Territory, deep in the heart of the outback. If I wanted to go to the seaside, I'd have to travel at least a thousand kilometers in any direction. That is, if I didn't die of thirst in the desert first. What isolation, except there's a town here. And this town used to be the hub of Australia's communications. Every word that left the continent passed through here. Must have some stories to tell, mustn't it? It's called Alice Springs, by the way. Come on. Today, my epic walk is crossing the finishing line at Alice Springs. Starting at a telegraph station and ending, strangely enough, at an airport. I'll meet the students of the world's largest classroom. The furthest away is probably about 1,200 kilometres. Play bathtub jockey to some river runners. They've collapsed, we're winning! And uncover a tiny piece of Outback USA. It really was secret, wasn't it? Yeah, and they'd say, what do you do out there? Oh, we're a weather research station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the first half of the 19th century, Australia was virtually cut off from the rest of the planet. For instance, if you wanted to send a letter to the UK, it would take the best part of half a year and another half year to get the message back. So, in 1870, a private company said that they would lay a telegraph cable under the ocean from Java down to Darwin, provided that the South Australian government would lay an overland cable from Darwin down to Port Augusta, and then, once that happened, Australians would be able to communicate with the outside world in a matter of hours rather than weeks or months. <laughs> The Overland Telegraph was a mammoth feat of engineering, more than 3,000 kilometres through a cruel, barren landscape. Amazingly, it took just two years to complete. And this is the substation that was right at the centre of the line, indeed, right at the heart of Australia, at Alice Springs. And though that little girl might not have realised it, she was standing at the hub of this early mass communication system, because every sentence, every word that any Australian wanted to be read in Europe or Asia or Africa or America passed right through there. For years, the Alice Springs Telegraph Station was like a giant central server, and its clicking, clacking, clattering machinery sent and received the world's noisiest emails. When the telegraph line was replaced in 1932, the substation was closed down, and it became a home for mixed-race kids who were taken away from their mums and were forced to live the lives of white kids. Now, in retrospect, this was a pretty horrific social experiment, but it did have one interesting outcome. A little, very bright young boy called Charlie, who was born right here and went on to become Charles Perkins, the first Aboriginal man ever to get a university degree in Australia and later became one of the most respected campaigners for Aboriginal rights from the 1960s right through to the time that he died. And he once had a football trial for Manchester United. Now, I bet you didn't know that. When you come to Alice Springs, it doesn't take long before you realise that this tiny little dot in the middle of a big red landscape is full of contradictions. Look at this magnificent boulder-strewn ridge, lots of lovely gums. And over here, we've got a huge highway and the suburbs. That's Alice for you. But that's where I'm going. I didn't realise it, but this tiny town is divided into 20 even tinier suburbs. I'm in Breitling, about to relive my feckless youth. I'm going back to school. 
But in typically perverse Alice style, this is no ordinary school. Ken, you can tell us a bit about The Hobbit, because I know you've been reading it. Well, Bilbo, the main character, at the beginning of the journey was very timid and nervous. This school of the air classroom is about four times the size of the entire UK, all up about one million square kilometres. Bags not sit up the back. There's about 25, 26 kids okay, that Joe's well, talking to. And the furthest away is probably so about 1,200 kilometres. The nearest may be about 100 kilometres um, away. We've actually got a special guest come to visit us in the studio today. Person who's travelled lots of places all around the world and has finished up here in the middle of Australia in Alice Springs. So I'd like you to welcome Tony Robinson. He's come to have a visit. Thank you. Hi, Let's hi, see. Hi. I can change our camera around with a bit of a push of a button here. Hi. Uh, what's the best thing about this school as far as you're concerned? And what's the worst? Um, I think the worst thing is probably being like remote and isolated doing school here. And the best thing being here, yeah, we have um, a tutor in our classroom who is our supervisor. Back in the 50s, students listened in on crackly radios. Thanks to satellite dishes, I can sit here and put faces to names and reach places I couldn't walk to in seven days, let alone one. My question is, is it harder to find places in Australia because Australia is so much younger than England? That's a really interesting question. Well, of course, before white people came over to Australia, there, there's far more occupation than ever in England. England's only been occupied for 10,000 years, whereas Australia, it's 50, 60,000 years, something like that. We're, we're not quite sure yet. So I think as we get more sophisticated in learning how to work out the history of a place, there'll be more and more and more and more history of those early years in Australia. But in 200 years, wham, it's just exploded to such a phenomenal degree. Now, that in itself is a brilliant story. And weirdly, of course, you're part of it now. You are. You are one of those stories right now. <laughs> and you're also incredibly polite. Look, they're they all are. saying, thank you, Mr Robinson. <laughs> thank you, thank you, too. And thank all you, right. too, guys. Thank you yeah. very much. Yep, that's Bye. excellent. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. One of the things that really stuck out for me when I was talking to the kids was how polite they are, uh, how articulate they are, and how smart they are. And I reckon at least some of that must be to do with this kind of schooling, because if you think of it, they get far more attention than most kids do and have to give more attention back. So although you might think, oh, isn't it tragic that they're all so far away from each other and they can't interact, well, maybe, but I reckon there are a lot of pluses to this kind of schooling. Having left the world's largest classroom, I'm heading for another of Alice's quirky contradictions. Just on the outskirts of town, there's a tiny, derelict piece of the USA. This little man-made hump in the landscape's very intriguing. In fact, it's more than intriguing. This was at one time of top-secret international importance because it was here where they used to monitor who'd got nuclear weapons and whether or not they were testing them. The business end was, was down there, of course. Harold, you were in the US forces at the time, weren't you? I was. So what was it exactly they were doing down there? This vault holds a set of seismometers that is used to detect earthquakes and nuclear explosions. And it's a part of the United States Atomic Energy Detection System. And it really was secret, wasn't it? Yes. We'd meet people downtown and they'd say, what do you do out there? Oh, we're a weather research station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even today, a lot of people around here don't know what no. this place was. No, they don't. Can we have a look inside? We absolutely can. <laughs> we'll open <laughs> it up here. How do we get in? Who we'll opened the ladder? The ladder, unfortunately, is on this side. <laughs> right, am I going down first? I guess you're going down first. Wait. It's very rusty. And a little bit scary. These old bones of mine don't work like they did when they were 20. Look, these are the things, I guess, where all the seismic detection took place. Harold, mm -hmm. how many places like this would there have been around the world, do you reckon? Oh, 18, 20, something like that. 
all around the Soviet Soviet bloc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the early 60s, especially, because they were the only people that had nuclear weapons that we were monitoring. And, and what was in here? There was three seismometers, one in each tank. Yeah. This, as you can tell, this vault's been empty for a long time. Yeah. And it's because modern technology has replaced the old instruments that used to be in here. And we do a better job with newer stuff. Well, thank you for sharing <laughs> it with me. I'll turn this off now and climb my way back up to the surface. Oh. Very good to meet you. Same here. You know what I find so extraordinary? 40 years or so ago, all that was cutting-edge technology, and now it's as redundant as a cannon from the Crimean War. Such a fast pace our history goes now, doesn't it? Today, I'm in Alice Springs. The little town at the heart of Australia is the last stop on my epic overland and sea walk. I've visited a colonial communications hub, been schooled in the world's largest classroom, and explored a Cold War hotspot. Time for another Alice Springs contradiction, the upside-down Todd River. The dry riverbed, which sits on top of the watercourse, is also home to the oldest continuous single event in the Northern Territory. It's called Henley on Todd, and it involves these things. John, how Tony. old is Henley on Todd? Well, it's been running for 53 years. Well, this is the 53rd running of it. And why is it called Henley on Todd? Oh, I think the English people pinched the name from us. Oh, you mean... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the taking... Henley, Henley on Tim. So. The Henley Regatta in, in right. London. Yeah. Like its English counterpart, the Henley on Todd attracts huge crowds each year. Unlike its English counterpart, Alice's premier social event is entirely lacking in the thing that makes a regatta a regatta, water. This is what we call a sand bike. Yeah. It's not really a boat. You can climb into it and you just run along the sand. So it's a bike for the sand. You want to give it a try? Yeah, have a go. Here we go. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> you, do have, you do have to let go, though. <laughs> That's better, yeah, mate. Oh, once you get the knack, it's dead easy to break your leg, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the sand keeps dropping on my head every time I leave. Right, show me another one. All right, let's have a look at our 12 metre yacht. Yeah. So, so how many people man this? 12. That's what we call a 12, oh, 12 metre yacht. <laughs> so you just question. jump aboard. Yeah. So climb aboard. Yeah. And then you pick this up. Yeah and then you run in the sand with it. Now, it's fairly heavy, so that's why you need 12 people. Yeah. And finally, yeah, now, this is more my races. thing. Yeah, well, how'd you like to have a ride in one of these? Oh, I'd love to, yeah. Well, jump in. Should we have a race? Well, we can do. Why don't we do that? Go, go race, race, guys. race with yeah. Uh, Tony. Yeah, OK. All right, yeah, no, jump on those. in. Yeah. Right, how many of these vehicles or, or ships, should I say, are going to take part in this race? Well, today we just have two, but oh, usually right. we have right, heats of four. Yeah. Oh! Make yourself comfortable. Oh. OK, John, so what are we going to have to do? What we have to do is we have to run down to the buoys. Go! Yeah. They've gone! They've gone! Go, 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 go. Come on! Anyone got any uh, bubble bath? Here we go. Go that way! Go that way! Hey! Come on! Hey! Come on, pick yourselves up. Hey, come on! We're on the home stretch! They've collapsed, we're winning! Stroke! Uh, stroke! <laughs> stroke! Oh, stroke! Oh, stroke! Number two. <laughs> stroke! Stroke! Oh, brilliant! Do an anchor! Fantastic! Oh, thank you! Oh, I enjoyed that! You need a lift oh, down there! This is living history! <laughs> oh! I like that! Thank you for sharing with me some of the finest history of Alice Springs. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye. OK, it's taken a while, but I'm hitting the heart of this town. I wonder if Market Day in Todd Mall can throw up something out of the ordinary. A couple of gorgeous Port Lincoln parrots over there. One of them's clawing away at a sachet of white sugar, probably more calories than a 
double burger with fries and a shake. Maybe they're breeding a whole new generation of obese parrots. It's still funny how and where town starts. There was virtually nothing here at all in the late 19th century, apart from the telegraph and a few prospectors and the odd drunk and a few shacks selling bits and bobs. It wasn't even called Alice Springs in those days. It was Stuart. It was named after the explorer John Stuart, who passed vaguely in this direction. And it wasn't until the late 1920s, when the railway came here, that it was designated the capital of central Australia. It was still called Stuart, though. It wasn't until 1933 that it became known as Alice Springs. It picked up the name of the settlement down the road. Still, though, very small, very underdeveloped. But the thing that made Alice, the Alice Springs we know today, was the Second World War. 200,000 armed forces passed through here. Imagine the amount of energy and business and excitement that must have brought here. That's when Alice really began. Back in the 1940s, it was essentially a staging post for soldiers making the arduous train and truck journey to Darwin and beyond to fight the Japanese further north. I wonder what those diggers would think of Alice now, with its markets and tourists and didgeridoo players. Hi, Tony. <laughs> How do you do? Good, good to meet you. Just wondering whether you'd like to connect with your inner didgeridoo-ness. It's something I've always wanted to do all my life, of course. <laughs> that kind of connection. I wouldn't mind if there's nobody else about. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever tried before? No, I haven't, no. OK. <laughs> awesome sound. <laughs> awesome. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's terrible. <laughs> Would you play us a piece? Sure, sure, sure. Didgeridoo, didgeridoo didn't. So I'll stick to what I do best. I'm walking down Hartley Street now and I'm head. Hang on, hang on. What's this? Try our emu, croc, and camel. Well, I knew about emu and croc, but I didn't know they served camel around here. Come on. Hello? Hello? Hi. G'day, mate. Uh, hi, we're... Uh, my name's Tony Robinson. We're doing a series called Tony Robinson's Time Walks. You're... I'm Crafty Tony. Hi, Crafty. How are you, mate? All right? Very nice yeah, to meet good. you. Hiya. Tony's my name. Tony, very nice Tony's name. Well. Thank you. Um, I saw outside that you sell things like emu and kangaroo and all that. That we do, yeah, thing. of course, yeah. Could I have a taste of something? Oh, I guess you can. Not a problem, mate. Tony, got some tucker there for him? Just come over and... That's very kind of you. What's this one? What is it? Crocodile. Crocodile. Yeah, crocodile, crocodile mate. Let's have a go. We would normally serve that in the volavon just to value add it. Mmm, well, it's a nice sauce, nice volavon yeah. sauce. Take your time, mate. It doesn't freak me out or anything. Um, <laughs> what's this one? Uh, that's emu, mate, actually. Oh, can I have a go on that? Emu's a big bird, yeah, by yeah. all means, yeah. Lovely. You might have to borrow yeah, that. I will, yeah, yeah, by all means. We haven't got a life tone, have you? <laughs> oh, lovely, thanks. There we go. Oh, that's great. No problem. Mmm, it's bitter out as a meat, isn't it? Yeah, yeah no. It's hot yeah. in there, isn't it? Bit warm. Oh. Plenty of heat in this kitchen normally, mate. <laughs> What's um, this one? And um, that's kangaroo, mate. Kangaroo? Which is a very lean, mate, yep. Normally served at medium rare. Mmm. It said camel as well. Whoa! Hey! That's a big camel, isn't it? It certainly is. It was actually a baby camel. A weighs baby? In, yeah, it weighs in at about 24 kilos. Oh, that's uh, a... Normally they weigh in at about 45 to 50, but uh, uh, that's the way it is tonight. So it's a very healthy mate camel. Which is a very nice mate. It's fantastic. 
In the 19th century, imported Afghan cameleers and their beasts were vital to exploration of Australia's harsh interior. When motorised transport took over, many camels were released. Today, their feral descendants are environmental pests. There's millions of them running around the deserts. Millions of camels? Millions of camels, and they've all been introduced. So uh, we're doing our little, little bit here at the restaurant to serve a very, very healthy meat to our customers. And balance the environment? Absolutely, mate. Good on you. Well, Thanks. I'll, shoot, I'll, I'll have the paddle the next time, all right? No worries. Enjoy, enjoy your stay in Alice Springs. So, bye. Thank See you, mate. See you, mate. Cheers. Bye. What a character. This is Alice Springs, and I've got good news and bad news. Unfortunately, I'm almost at the end of my second series of walks. The good news is, well, I still have a few surprises up my sleeve. Come in here. There's something that I want to, uh, to show you. Can you see this is the Ida Stanley Preschool? So, Ida Stanley, right, she was this very inspirational teacher, who lived around here in the 1920s. Originally, she just taught white children, but she wanted to teach the Aboriginal kids as well. And reluctantly, eventually, she was allowed to do that, although they had to be segregated first of all. And to celebrate her life, this is long after she was dead, they opened a preschool here. Yep, there it is down there, the plaque. And it's the Ida Stanley Preschool Centre, officially opened by Mr H.V. Moss. Who was H.V. Moss? Well, I didn't know. Certainly nobody around here appeared to know. But we found somebody who does know. Mary, <laughs> come here. Mary is uh, one of our producers. You know who H.V. Moss is, don't you? He was my great uncle, and he was a pilot for a long time in the Northern Territory. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. But the ridiculous thing is that the reason that he opened this preschool is that they looked all around for other celebrities and they couldn't find any. So eventually they said, Oi, Harry, you open it. So he did. <laughs> When you come to Central Australia, there's one thing you've just got to see. And according to the locals, it's just down the road. Only just down the road means about 450 kilometres away. So I'm going to take a plane. Look, I know it's Tony Robinson's time walks, but don't beat me up. It is the end of the series. And what an end, eh? For thousands of years, the local Anangu people called this sacred place Uluru. Until some white fella came along and decided to call it Ayers Rock, after South Australia's chief secretary, Sir Henry Ayers. The story of its discovery by Europeans begins in the year 1873, when two expeditions left Alice Springs in order to try and find a way across the central desert and eventually find Perth. One was led by Peter Warburton, and the other by William Goss. Warburton managed to get through to the northwest coast, but it was at tremendous cost. All his camels died, his men were skeleton thin, he was half blinded, and he was still a couple of thousand kilometers from Perth. William Goss didn't get so far, but in terms of what he found, he was much more successful. Three months into his journey, he saw this extraordinary formation dominating the landscape. Then, like all good explorers do, he set out to climb it, along with one of his hardy Afghan camel drivers, a bloke called Kamran. This is what he wrote in his diary. How I envied him his hard feet. He seemed to enjoy walking in bare feet, whereas mine were all blisters and it was as much as I could do to stand. So which of those two blokes got to the top of that rock first? Was it the one with the dodgy feet or the seasoned bushman? We'll never know for sure, but I know who my money's on. Right, guys, that's a final wrap. Let's go. Hey. <laughs> That's it, folks. 
After 10 walks, hundreds of kilometres and heaven knows how many great yarns, I'm hanging up my walking shoes. For now. You know how you go to a rock concert for the headline act and there's this weird trio playing balalaikas and Jews harps and they're the ones that you rock along to? Well, maybe that's just me, but it, in these walks, that's how it's felt for me. The, I've loved the, the big stories, but actually it's been the funny, odd ones about ordinary Australians, their hopes and their fears and their passions and their failures and their sheer daftness that has remained in my mind. And being here, right in the centre of Australia, buzzing round me like the flies, it feels as though there are all these stories and the really great thing is, there's a million more yet to be discovered. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.